Good evening. Welcome to the webinar on how to produce and use sweet forages. Tonight's webinar is co-hosted by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and their, beef, their science cluster partners for beef and dairy, the Dairy Farmers of Canada and the Beef Cattle Research Council. My name is Tracy Herbert and I'll be your moderator tonight. And I'm the Extension Coordinator for the Beef Cattle Research Council or BCRC. You and 156 other people registered tonight from all across the country as well as a few international guests, so welcome. As usual, about 70% of our webinar audience is producers. This same topic will be presented again en français at a later date, uh, April 29th, I believe. And that one will be hosted by the dairy farmers, so details on the French one can be found through the dairy research blog. Tonight's session will last for approximately one hour, but may go longer if you've got lots of questions for us during, during the Q&A period near the end. We are recording this session, and I will email out a link to the recording to everyone that registered in a couple of days. So if you miss hearing anything tonight and want to take a listen again, or if some of your friends or neighbors didn't get a chance to hear about this in time, that recording will be available to everyone that's interested. I also encourage you to take a few notes tonight that will help you to remember some more of what you hear. For those of you watching this live, you'll be able to hear and see the presenters tonight, but we can't hear or see you. So if you want to communicate with us, what you need to do is type into the small chat window in the control panel on the side of your screen. If you have a question or comment for me or any of the presenters, that's the place to do it. And feel free to send in questions at any time. We'll answer them all near the end of the hour. If your internet connection is a bit slow tonight, it might help to close the webcam window. So if you choose to do that, you won't be able to see us, but hopefully that will make the audio come through a little bit more clearly and make the slides load for you a little bit faster. Okay, let's get started. So here's what we'll be covering tonight. First you'll hear from Dr. Gilles Boulanger, who will start things off with a 20-minute presentation. Then we'll have some audience participation where you'll have a chance to answer some multiple choice questions on your screen. Then we'll hand it over to Robert Breton and open it up to questions from you uh, before finishing the webinar and letting you know where to find more information that you'll be interested in. The third name that you saw when registering tonight, Dr. Guitan Tremblay, is listening in as well, um, but you likely won't hear from him tonight. He's, he'll be presenting during the French webinar. So with that, I am pleased to introduce the first guest speaker this evening, Dr. Gilles Boulanger. Dr. Boulanger is a research scientist at the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada Soils and Crops Research and Development Centre in Quebec City, as well as an adjunct professor at Laval University. He has significantly contributed to the development of innovations and knowledge on questions related to growth and quality of forage crops, winter survival of perennial crops, potential impact of climate change to forage crops, diagnostic methods of nitrogen and phosphorus deficiency, and the benefits of legume grass mixtures. As the recipient of the 2013 Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association Leadership Award, he is recognized by beef, dairy, and forage industry sectors for his outstanding contributions to improving the productivity and adaptation of forages in eastern Canada. So please welcome Gilles. Well, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be uh, with you tonight to talk about uh, producing and uh, using uh, sweet forages and to talk to you about some of the research that we've done along with my colleagues, uh, Robert Bertiaume and Guénard Tremblay, on how to produce and how to use uh, uh, sweet forages. The first question that you probably have is why do, why do we need to produce sweet forages and why should we do it? And I think that has to do uh, very much uh, with the way the rumen functions and the importance of, uh, of the growth of microbes in the, uh, in the rumen. And the growth, of, the growth of those microbes depends on both the energy of the forage and the protein content of that forage, 
And in, in a typical forage, we often have an imbalance between the uh, energy that is available to the microbes and the proteins. And you can see that uh, it's illustrated on the graph on the left. What you have in green, uh, you have the uh, energy. And in blue, uh, you have the protein. And as you can see, there's an imbalance. And what limits the microbial growth, what is uh, shown in, in red, is the um, available energy. So if we increase the uh, concentration of sugars in, in forages, uh, we'll have more energy available to the microbes. And, and if you look at the graph on the bottom, then you'll see that uh, both protein and, and, and energies are balanced, and then we have a better uh, microbial growth. So uh, if we increase the sugar concentration in forages, uh, we're most likely to have a better intake from the animals, and that's been shown uh, both in the U.S. by a group who's worked on uh, cutting forages in the afternoon with PM cutting, and they've shown very clearly that if you do that and you feed that high sugar forage to, to uh, cattle, you'll have better intake. It, also, it has also been shown in the U.K. In that case, they've developed uh, varieties of, of uh, perennial ryegrass with high sugars, and when they fed that uh, high sugar grass to uh, dairy cattle, they also had better intake. The work done in the UK as well has shown that if you, if you use high sugar grasses in feeding dairy cattle, uh, you improve the efficiency with which uh, nitrogen is used by the, uh, by the dairy cows. So overall, there's you know, fairly strong evidence to show that uh, by increasing the sugar concentration in forages, you can improve the performance of ruminants, and you can also reduce the uh, nitrogen losses to the environment. So what we will do in the next hour, uh, we will uh, first, and that's the part that we're presenting to you, talk about the management practices that can be used to uh, uh, modify the sugar concentration in forages. Uh, I'll talk uh, mostly about uh, PM cutting uh, in comparison to cutting in the morning. And I'll also talk uh, more briefly about uh, the selection of species, uh, the potential of genetic selection, and I'll say a very quick word on nitrogen fertilization of grasses. So this will be the first part of the presentation, the first 20 minutes. Then in the second part of the evening, uh, my colleague Robert Bertillon will talk about uh, sweet forages and, and the benefits that you get uh, by feeding uh, uh, forages with higher sugar concentration, the benefits that you get for dairy cows. Most of the work that we've done uh, was with dairy cows, but uh, Robert has been involved, involved, has been involved with work on, on with beef cattle as well, so he'll present some of that at the end of his presentation. Uh, before I start talking about cropping practices, uh, <clears throat> when we talk about sugars, uh, we refer to the total non-structural carbohydrates that you find in the forage. By opposition to the structural carbohydrates that are hemicellulose and, and cellulose, the non-structural carbohydrates, essentially there are two uh, broad types. There's the soluble carbohydrates and the starch. And the soluble carbohydrates are made of sucrose, glucose, and fructose. In the case of, of legume species like alfalfa, you have also pinitol. And in the case of grasses, you also have fructan. So that gives you, you'll see through the presentation, most of the time I'll be talking about sugars, but you'll see in a few cases where we talk about non-structural carbohydrates, that's the same thing as, as, uh, as sugar. So now I'll, I'll uh, start with talking about uh, PM cutting of foraged crops. And uh, <clears throat> the first thing that uh, we looked at was to see what happens during the day uh, when you uh, have a crop growing on a given day. And we've taken samples uh, right through the day, starting early in the morning, about an hour after sunrise, right until the end of the afternoon, uh, early evening. And as you can see, uh, this is one example from one location and then one growth cycle. We did this on, on several growth cycles and location. But uh, this, uh, this example, as you can see, uh, as, you, uh, as you go through the day, there is an increase uh, in, uh, in, uh, sugar to in non sexual carbohydrates, that is the total amount of sugars. And that increase comes mostly from the uh, starch. Uh, that's the case with alfalfa. And what happens during the day uh, as the crop uh, uh, goes on with photosynthesis, producing sugars, it 
produces sugars faster than the crop can use it to, uh, for its growth. So there's an accumulation of sugars during the day, and in the case of legume species, that accumulation is mostly in the form of starch, and that's what we see in this graph. <clears throat> the other thing that we see in this graph as well is that the maximum uh, sugar concentration is reached at the end of the afternoon uh, at about uh, uh, between 11 and 13 hours after sunrise. So increases during the day, if it's sunny day, this happens in all crops, and the maximum is reached towards the end of the afternoon. I just presented a slide on alfalfa. We have very similar results with Timothy. Again, that's just one cycle that we've studied. In this case, you have the NSC, the non-structural carbohydrates at the top. Those are total sugars. And as you can see, it increases uh, during the day and reaches a maximum uh, towards the end of the afternoon. In the case of Timothy, uh, there's no, no starch in Timothy and in most grasses, so the increase comes from an accumulation of, uh, of sucrose. <clears throat> so the first point I think that I wanted to make is that if you want to increase uh, sugar concentration in your forage, probably the easiest thing to do is to cut it, uh, to cut your forages in the afternoon. Uh, as you can see in the two examples that I've given, uh, the concentration of sugars increases during the day, and it can increase from between two and four units of percentage. That is, it can go from six in the morning to eight percent at the end of the day, and the maximum is reached towards the end of the afternoon, early evening, about 11 to 13 hours after sunrise. So I've just showed you a couple of examples of what happens during the day. Uh, we did this work looking at PM cutting also on, on a number of, uh, of forage species that are widely grown in Canada, uh, uh, reed canary grass, smooth brome grass, meadow brome grass, tall fescue, timothy, uh, Kentucky bluegrass, and also on red clover and alfalfa. In this graph, you have the sugars, uh, and then you have in green uh, the PM cutting, and in red the AM cutting. And as, that, as you can see, uh, for all the, the four species that we had, uh, there was an increase in sugar concentration with PM cutting. The increase, however, differed among species. It was the greatest with reed canary grass, but as I said, it occurred in all uh, in all species. And uh, with an overall mean for all species of 1.5 per, uh, units of percentage. Uh, we looked at it again uh, at the top, that was with the spring growth. We looked at it as well on the summer regrowth. And again, uh, for all, for most of our species, there was an increase with PM cutting when you compare the green versus the red. And uh, this increase varied with species. And on average, for all species, we had an increase of 2.1 percentage units. So the increase with sugar concentration with PM cutting, uh, the increase can be up to almost five percentage units. It will depend on forage species and also on the growth period, whether it's in the spring or the summer. But overall, what we've seen in the study is we had an, an average increase of 1.8 percentage unit with PM cutting compared to uh, AM cutting. So having said that, some of you will probably say, well, that's fine, you can have greater uh, sugar concentration at the end of the afternoon, but what happens when you cut the crop and you let, let it uh, lay on the field for uh, a day or two? What will happen? Will you lose that gain that you've made by cutting uh, in the PM? So we looked at that as well, and this is, again, just one example of several growth cycles that we looked at. So if you look at the... Uh, here, so with again the same idea, we've took samples at different times uh, with the crop uh, in, uh, after it's been cut in the field. Uh, the first point that we have is one where we cut in PM, and then we cut the next morning. This is the point that you see here. As you can see, there was a difference in sugar concentration between AM and PM cutting at the start. In both cases, it decreased over time, and that's normal because even though plants have been cut, they're still uh, alive and they continue to respire for a number of hours, so they'll use some of the sugars through their respiration. That's a normal decrease. But then if you go at the end of the wilting period, you see that the difference that we had at the time of cutting, we still have it at the end of the wilting period. So essentially, throughout the wilting process, the difference between in sugar concentration between 
p.m. and a.m. cutting is maintained so that at the end of the wilting period when it's time to ensile, it's still, you still have that difference. The This example that I've given you here is a situation where we uh, cut the crop and let it uh, uh, lay on the field uh, without swathing. Then the question is what happens if you reduce the cutting width and you reduce the, the, the width of the crop on, lying on the field with using swathing and we looked at that as well and, and what we found is that if you use swathing uh, if, uh, then you reduce your sugar concentration. So you can compare on the top curve you have the PM cutting with no swathing. On the blue curve below you have PM cutting in the case where the, there was swathing of the crop. And as you can see uh, in that situation uh, you, have, uh, you, you have less sugars. And the same thing with the AM cutting with no swath. And if you have AM cutting with swathing you have less sugars at the end of the wilting period. So cutting alpha at the end of the day and in this case, we talk about 16 to 18 hours, uh, six, between 4 and 6 p.m., I should say, without swatting is the best way to maximize sugar concentration in a wilted forage. Of course, that works well if you have good wilting conditions if the crop doesn't sit in the field for four or five days. But if you have good conditions, the best strategy to increase the sugars in your forages is to cut p.m. without swatting, and if you make salad, you should be ready to be in salad the following day. Uh, as I said, we look at this for a number of record cycle. That's just a summary of all these, these studies that we've done looking at uh, AM and PM with and without swathing. And then, uh, as you can see again, we have the PM cutting in green, AM cutting in red. And as you see for all the cycles in 2007, 8, 9, and the different growth cycles that we looked at, there was an increase in sugar concentration with PM cutting. And then if you compare uh, swathing without swathing, uh, when we refer to wide here, it means there was no swath, the narrow, we had swathing, and as you can see, sugar concentration is greater without swathing than uh, with swathing, and that occurred in most growth cycles. Uh, I've just talked about uh, PM cutting and what you see on the standing crop uh, if you cut in the evening or in the morning and the benefits that you have at PM cutting. We've seen that that benefit is maintained throughout the wilting period and the benefit is even greater if you don't use swathing. Then the next question is well, what happens during fermentation if you make silage out, out, out of this material? <clears throat> and what we've done, we've done a number of studies and I'll just summarize that with one slide, is that the differences in sugar concentration due to PM cutting uh, are usually reduced when it goes through the fermentation process because during fermentation sugars are used uh, by the microorganisms uh, for, for, for the fermentation. So there will be a reduction and we'll lose some of that benefits that we get from PM cutting. If you make uh, haylage with uh, at 50 percent dry matter, you'll still have, you will still have a difference uh, at, at the end of the, of the uh, ensiling period, whereas if you make silage with a 25 percent dry matter material, then you might lose a lot of the difference that you had initially at the time of, of uh, uh, of, uh, at the end of the wilting period. What we found as well is that if you have a, a, a forage that is enriched in, in sugars and we, th we think of about uh, one unit per percentage uh, 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 increase, that silage will, and, and that's the case with alfalfa, will, will have better conservation, better fermentation, and at the end it will also have a lower pH, a higher lactate concentration, and lower uh, ammonia concentration. These are three characteristics that are significant in terms of uh, characterizing silage quality. So essentially if you have more sugars at the end of wilting period when you ensile, you'll also have better fermentation. So improved silage conservation attributes uh, with higher sugar concentration <coughs> that might result also in greater uh, residual starch concentration. We've seen that in some cases and uh, that uh, uh, should result into a, an improvement in milk production and we'll see that in the second part of the presentation with, uh, with Haber. Uh, so I've talked in the first part of the presentation with PM cutting and that's probably the best strategy to increase your concentration in forages. 
In the, in the last, the next few minutes, I'll just talk briefly about three other aspects. First, the species selection. You've seen some of the graphs earlier on species, but I didn't mention differences between species. But here we've tried to summarize that. And as you can see, uh, we have a number of all the species that we've looked at. Um, most of the species you probably know. And two of the species uh, tended to have a greater uh, sugar concentration. That's tall fescue. And um, in terms of the legume species, uh, we have red clover that uh, also had a higher uh, sugar concentration. On the other hand, we had uh, reed canary grass and alfalfa that tended to have lower uh, sugar concentrations. So there are uh, differences among species uh, for sugar concentration. So uh, <coughs> selecting the species can also have an impact in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of producing uh, sweet uh, forages. Uh, a quick word about uh, the potential of genetic selection. I've mentioned at the start of the presentation that our colleagues in the UK were quite successful. They've, they developed varieties of, of perennial ryegrass that uh, have a higher sugar concentration. Uh, and they've been uh, uh, marketing those for quite a while uh, around the world. We've tried to look at uh, a crop that, we, that is widely used here uh, in, in Eastern Canada and in Western Canada as well, is alfalfa. So we did some preliminary work looking at uh, selecting for high uh, sugar concentration and, 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 and also for low sugar concentration, we also had a control population. So we had these three populations that were selected for, for sugar concentration. And we put those in the field in the establishment year and in production years. And as you can see, in both establishment year and production year, when you look at the bar in green, that's the population selected for high sugar concentration. It had high sugar concentration. So that's what that was quite uh, encouraging. In the same uh, study, we also look at AN versus PM on these same populations. And again, we found this benefits of, of the PM cutting in red compared to the, to the yellow bars. So that helped us to put in perspective the improvements that we can make through breeding and also through management. And that's what we see here that with genetic selection, with the work that we did, which is not completed yet, we could improve sugar concentration by about one percentage unit. With PM cutting, what we've seen, and you've seen a number of data in the presentation, we can increase sugar concentration by up to four percentage units. So we still have work to do in terms of genetic select, we, we are supposed to be with more cycles of selection, we could do better. But at this point, uh, this is what we obtain. Finally, the last uh, part is on end fertilization. I wanted to uh, say a word on about that because it's quite significant for grass growth and yield. Uh, we did a study at, uh, we, we had two sites, uh, two years in New Lister and one year in caps casing in, in Ontario. We had different uh, nitrogen rates, uh, as you can see at the bottom axis. And uh, we look at sugar concentration, and we did not really see much of an effect of end fertilization on sugar concentration. This was taken at the heading stage of the Timothy. Uh, we also looked at it at the anthesis stage, stage, which is a bit later. And again, uh, we couldn't see much of a difference uh, due to nitrogen fertilization. Uh, so in this case, uh, no effect of end fertilization, but uh, the uh, level of end nutrition in this study was quite high. Uh, it would be interesting to look at it where you have more uh, restricted uh, end nitrogen nutrition, but in that case, you'd have lower yield as well. So uh, in most situations where you fertilize your grass with a sufficient nitrogen, you probably wouldn't see much of an effect on sugar concentration. So uh, to conclude my a portion of the presentation. I think I, I hope that you've seen uh, that with PM cutting and white swathing and uh, species selection, uh, <coughs> that can be used to increase uh, the concentration of sugars in your forages. And that can vary uh, for conditions, but it can be by uh, two to four percentage units. In the second part of the presentation, Robert will tell you what is the impact of increasing sugar concentration on uh, animal production. So this is it for me. I'll uh, pass this back to, to Tracy. Great. Thank you very much, Jill. OK. 
Okay, so now uh, we want to hear from you in the audience. We're going to ask you some polling questions. So what's going to happen? I'm going to launch a multiple choice question on your screen. You'll click on your answer and then we'll all see the results together. And your answers to poll questions like these are anonymous to everyone else that's on the line. So our first question is, at what time of the day do you usually start mowing your fields? Early morning, mid-morning, early afternoon, or late afternoon? When do you normally start cutting? Go ahead and click on your answer. Let's give you a couple more seconds to get those in. Okay, let's see the results. So 48% mid-morning, 43% early afternoon, 14% uh, late afternoon, and then the remaining 11% early morning. Second question uh, is whether cutting at the end of the day, so after 4 p.m., is possible on your farm? Or do you have other commitments or other things preventing you from cutting after 4 p.m.? Couple more seconds. Okay, the results. Good, 90% of you said yes, it is possible to cut after four. And our last question uh, is wide swathing, so greater than 80% of the cutting width, an option on your farm. So far, the results are just about 50-50. Okay. So 55% said yes, it is possible for wide swathing. Okay. So that's it for poll questions. I now have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Robert Bertillon. Uh, Dr. Bertillon spent many years as a nutrition researcher at the Dairy and Swine Research and Development Center in Sherbrooke, Quebec, and at the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada Center in Capus Casing as their bovine production specialist. He is now the dairy production expert in forage systems with Vlacta, a company that works with dairy farms across Quebec and Atlantic Canada to improve their profitability. He is an excellent communicator and passionate about about transferring um, scientific ideas and technologies to farmers. So please welcome Robert. Thank you very much, Tracy. Hopefully everyone can hear me fine out there. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, like Jill said, uh, we did a lot of work and uh, we hope that you'll uh, appreciate uh, some of that work and see what kind of impact it can have on your operation. So now we'll talk about um, what happens in, um, in, the, in the, the bulk tank when you feed sweet forages first and we'll talk about beef cattle a little later. So let's start with uh, three lactation trials that we ran in uh, Sherbrooke, Quebec in Lennoxville as a matter of fact, Ag Canada Research Centre. Uh, we looked at uh, cows in early lactation that were fed alfalfa haylage, mid lactation with Tim Timothy haylage, and late lactation cows with alfalfa again. So the methodology for the three lactation trials is pretty much constant, pretty much the same. The plants were cut late in the afternoon, so that's about 12 hours after sunrise, uh, after a, sun a sunny day obviously. Uh, or they were cut the next morning, early in the morning, uh, just at sunrise. Uh, plants were field dried and conserved as haylage. Uh, we are talking about, as you can see on the photograph, uh, large square bales that were harvested around 50 to 60 percent dry matter level. Uh, they, were, they were baled at this level of dry matter and wrapped in plastic. 
uh, they were uh, the feed was offered once daily in all trials. So as Jill mentioned earlier, uh, this is the principle that we were looking for. For example, in the early lactation trial, we used 18 cows. Eight of them were equipped with uh, cannulas in the rumen, so that gave us access to samples in the rumen. Uh, what we were looking for, as is shown here, is to balance the energy to protein supply in the rumen. The idea being that if we managed to do this, we would actually optimize microbial protein production. This would help us in reducing fecal nitrogen, but mostly urinary nitrogen. Fecal nitrogen is not too bad in the sense that you can always use it to fertilize your fields. Unfortunately, in the case of urinary nitrogen, you lose a lot of that to the atmosphere, and it's a real waste. The idea of reducing urinary nitrogen is to increase, obviously, milk uh, production, milk protein production in the case of dairy cows. So let's start with this uh, first trial with early lactation cows. As mentioned earlier, we did cut uh, forage in the yellow bar here in the AM, red bar in the PM. We ended up with a, a level of sugar of 4.3 versus 3%. Um, different, differential of 1.3 percent between the two groups um, uh, after uh, fermentation. Uh, this was fed um, in a complete diet that was made out of 59 percent forage, 41 percent of a common concentrate. So we ended up with a diet that was 28.7 percent sugars in the high treatment, 28.0 percent in the low treatment. Um, in terms of production, what we saw is basically very uh, little effect or no significant effect of the level of uh, sugars on um, either dry matter intake and or milk yield, uh, whether the cows were primiparous, the first calvers, or uh, later calvers in the multiparous group. Uh, the only thing we saw of any uh, nutritional significance in this case is that we had an interaction and we saw that in the case of primiparous uh, cows, so first calvers, um, they used nitrogen more efficiently, and that was showed in uh, the amount of milk uh, urea nitrogen that they excreted that went down significantly, as you can see here on the left. There was no effect on milk urea nitrogen for uh, later calvers or um, older cows, I mean second and third calvers. So, the conclusion we, drawn, we have drawn from this first trial was that an increase of uh, 0.7 units percentage in sugar uh, fed in a 41% concentrate diet. This was not a TMR, I'm sorry, this is a mistake. It was a, a separate diet here. Uh, due to PM cutting of alfalfa, did not affect intake in milk production, but caused a decrease in milk urea in the case of primiparous cows. Uh, we went on and used um, Timothy. Um, haylage, cut into PM and AM, and fed that to the same cows that were then in mid-lactation. Uh, so later on in lactation, they were fed, in this case, a TMR that was 65% uh, forage, 35% of a common concentrate. We ended up with a difference uh, of 0.9% sugars, 14.2 on di the diet that was high, 13.3 diet that was low in sugars. In this case, here we look on the y-axis at the energy corrected milk, so that's the amount of milk corrected for the contents of fat and protein. We see that both in both cases, like the primiparous and multiparous cows, we saw a significant increase associated with the red bar, which is the PM cut high sugar in this case, Timothy Halage. Uh, so we concluded from that study that a uh, increase of 0.9 percent units uh, of sugar in in uh, in the forage uh, associated with 35 percent concentrate TMR with mid, mid lactation cows um, improved energy corrected milk by about half a kilo per day in primiparous and 1.5 kilograms per day in multiparous cows. It improved also milk fat and milk protein contents, as I mentioned, 
uh, earlier energy corrected milk takes into account the uh, milk composition. So we thought that this would be a very economical and beneficial proposition for uh, dairy farmers. Third study we ran uh, with another group of 16 late lactation cows, in this case around 200 days in milk. Um, in this case, uh, we uh, saw or we harvested alfalfa that was much higher in sugars. And we ended up with a very high level of sugars uh, at the end of the fermentation. You can see here that the PM cut material was 12.8% sugars on a dry matter basis, while the AM cut was 10.5% sugars. Um, when we fed this, uh, this was fed straight with minerals to late lactation cows. Um, we um, saw a significant increase in dry matter intake by those cows, and this was reflected in a significant increase in milk yield by those cows. Again, this was energy corrected milk yield. There was also a significant decrease in milk urea nitrogen, suggesting that the cows that were fed the PM cut material higher in sugars uh, we're making better use of the protein present in the alfalfa haylage. So we concluded from that study that an increase of 2.3 units of uh, sugars um, in a uh, no concentrate TMR, basically a straight forage diet um, fed to late lactation cow, we saw an increase in dry matter intake and an increase in milk production and also this was associated with a reduction in milk urea nitrogen. Um, the primiparous and multiparous cows in that particular study reacted similarly. There was no interaction. So to summarize this, three different lactation studies with lactating dairy cows, benefits with mid and late lactation cows, uh, limited benefits to primiparous cows in the early lactation. However, you must remember that in the early lactation, early lactation cow study, the level of sugars in the alfalfa were quite low. Now, what about beef cattle? Well, in this case, the first thing we looked at with beef cattle was uh, animal preference. Jill mentioned earlier the work that was done in the U.S. by the uh, group that was led by Dr. Hank Mayland and Dr. Burns from North Carolina. These guys have shown um, across a number of, stu uh, of studies that animals such as uh, beef cattle, dairy cattle, horses, and rabbits, for example, do prefer um, high sugar forages. In this case, you have a photo showing a growing steer, crossbred um, Angus Charolais, that was fed um, in two different bunk, bunks side by side, um, a um, trefoil uh, orchard grass hay that was either cut in the PM or in the AM. This is the result of the, these are the results of this study. As you can see here on the black line, this is the PM cut material, and on the green line, this is the AM cut material. So the PM cut material was higher in sugar. On the y-axis, what we see here are the kilograms of dry matter remaining in the feed bunk after 2, 4, 8, and 24 hours. So basically what we did is we fed those animals with in two different bunks, side by side, the same amount of the PM and AMA, and we looked at the disappearance of that stuff. And you can see that very early on, the animals definitely prefer, preferred the PM cut um, hay, orchard grass trefoil in this case, and that's why this material disappeared faster and that's why the animals at the end of the day ate more than those that were fed the AM cut. So conclusion, um, cattle, uh, whether it's dairy or beef cattle, are able to detect uh, the presence of sugars, uh, probably through the smell, uh, and um, do eat more, prefer 
uh, those uh, forages, those higher sugar forages. Now, what about cows on pasture? Can we do something about this um, to try to capture some of this preference associated with high sugar grasses? At the back of that uh, cow-calf couple, you can see here the uh, tumble wheels from Gallagher. So what we did in that study is that we uh, managed the pasture as a strip grazing system, giving uh, the different uh, strips of pasture at different times of the day so that the animals would be enticed to eat at either 7, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, or 7 at night. We looked at the composition of the forage present, which were mostly a mix of grasses, native grasses. You can see here that the level of sugar increased significantly, uh, like Jill showed, uh, between the morning and late afternoon, early evening. In the case of the protein, we saw a decrease during the day, but this re-increased in the late afternoon. What about the effect on the cow-calf pairs? What we saw is that the cows that were fed uh, or offered the new pasture strip in the morning around 7 o'clock lost a small amount of weight during the summer season, while their calves gained about 1.2 kilograms per day. While the cows that were offered the new strip of pasture around the end of the afternoon, uh, approximately 11 hours after sunrise, the cows gained uh, live weight and their calves did outweight the others by uh, a small amount. They gained 1.28 kilograms of live weight per calf per day. So these uh, levels of increase were uh, uh, interesting to us and we thought we'd show you this tonight. Um, we think that the reason why all of those improvements that we have seen occur are because forages, is because sweet forages do improve protein synthesis in the rumen. Therefore, bacteria are working for you in this case and are um, uh, producing or improving the supply of amino acids to those animals that we are feeding, whether it's a dairy cow or growing steer and or a um, nursing beef cow. Um, here you have a study that we ran with two divergent lines of alfalfa that were selected for their sugar level. Jill showed you some of this data earlier. In this case, we did not keep the middle population, but we kept only the low sugar population and the high sugar population of this alfalfa. So those are genotypes. They were grown, and we had enough to feed um, in vitro uh, artificial rumens. You can see that the level of sucrose was significantly increased in the high sugar family here. The level of starch was also increased, so therefore total sugars were nearly threefold higher in the case of the high sugar population. How did the bacteria react? Those samples were sent to Lethbridge, Alberta. This photo was taken in the lab at Lethbridge Research Center, where they have what we call Hoover uh, fermenters that simulate the rumen of a um, ruminant. So um, bacteria were collected from uh, uh, lactating cows and they were fed to those rumen with those alfalfa samples. And the, these, call, these are called dual flow samples because we look at passage of liquid and solid feed through the rumen, trying to mimic what happens in a real rumen. In this case, uh, this confirmed our hypothesis uh, you see the high sugar bar, the green bar here, compared to the low sugar in orange. This is the nitrogen flow coming out of those rumens. This would be delivered to the intestine of either a growing steer and or a lactating cow. And you can see that we increased significantly the amount of protein coming out of there. 
And this increase was due to a very significant increase in the amount of microbial protein coming from those higher sugar uh, forages, in this case alfalfa. Um, this is why urea, uh, milk urea, is reduced in the case of lactating cows, as I've shown you earlier. Microbial protein, as you all know, is the best protein to feed to any ruminant because of its very good amino acid profile. So concluding on our, our animal um, performance studies, we concluded that PM cutting associated with wide swathing, which increases the drying rate in the forage, and also associated with species selection can be used to increase forage sugar concentrations. An increase of at least one unit percentage in forage sugar concentration can improve dry matter intake and milk production of dairy cows. And I would dare to say probably also beef cows and growing steers as we saw in those few unpublished studies that I've shown you at last. You should expect up to a 5% increase in milk production depending on the stage of lactation at which the animals are, which is uh, economically interesting considering that PM versus AM cutting should not increase your costs. With this, I'd like to thank you for, for your attention uh, and thank also um, are uh, the different uh, bodies that supported that research and my two collaborators on this presentation. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Robert. So we are now going to open it up to questions from the audience. Get organized here. So again, please type your questions into the chat box on the side of your screen. If your control panel has closed, you should see an orange arrow near the top. Click on that arrow and it'll expand again and you'll see the box to type your question into. Uh, also, if you would, let me know whether your question is directed at Gilles or Robert. Your questions here are anonymous to others on the line as well. I'll just read them out. So we do have a few questions in already, um, and one that was submitted ahead of time asked about the latest in new high sugar grasses because North American companies are marketing high energy grasses, but this person's understanding is that there are much better genetics coming. So if you could comment on that. Um, and then the question also goes on to ask about grass mixed with chicory or plantain. So, Robert, did you want to tackle that first? Um, I don't know. Um, I can. Um, I think that this person is uh, talking about some of the uh, high energy mixtures that are suggested by um, a few seed companies. Um, those mixtures are um, oftentimes associated with uh, tall fescue, for example. And as we've shown you earlier, Tall fescue is uh, amongst the grass species that we have studied uh, the highest in sugars. So it's not surprising to me that a mixture that would be composed of tall fescue uh, would um, have a higher level of sugars. Uh, if I can touch a little bit very briefly on chicory, I'm wondering here because I uh, we'll submit pretty soon a manuscript uh, on a grazing study where we actually used in the mixture, in the pasture mix, uh, chicory, forage chicory. And the forage chicory was not particularly high in uh, sugars. So I'm wondering if that person is alluding to um, the other type of, of chicory, which would be root chicory, uh, that contains a lot of fructan in the form of inulin. Uh, because in the case of forage chicory, I would only say that if it contains more sugars, I would, um, I would just say that you have to be careful not to feed too much forage chicory to dairy cows because it also contains uh, lactones that can give um, uh, taste to milk and uh, you don't necessarily want that. Okay, um, next question. 
How does cutting hay in the PM affect drying time, given that there is uh, very little time for moisture evaporation before cooler temperatures set in? Maybe I can, I can have a go at this, uh, this question. <clears throat> what we found is that if, if you cut in, in PM uh, at around between 4 and 6 PM, uh, the crop will dry a little bit, but uh, not enough to, uh, to essentially kill the plants. So the following morning, uh, the crud that's been cut in the evening will continue to photosynthesize. And that was a bit of a surprise to us, but we've made measurements. So the crop cut in the evening, the next morning, will, uh, as soon as the sun comes up, it'll start to photosynthesize and produce sugars again at the same rate as the crop, the crop that hasn't been cut. And then it will decrease as the crop dries out. And what we found is that it actually, you'll get to the point where you can ensile earlier if you've cut in the p.m. than if you've cut the morning because it will have dry a little bit in the, in the evening before. So essentially it doesn't really, uh, it, it really helps in some ways because you'll get some drying but not enough to prevent photosynthesis the next morning and then you'll be ready to ensile before the crop that you've cut the, 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 the morning. Okay, next question for you, Gio, is the AMPM difference changed at all with no crimping or conditioning of the hay? I read a piece out of New York that suggested that morning cut non-crimped would continue to convert nitrate to sugar after cutting. Uh, I'm not sure it will, if it will, well, if, if, you, if you cut the crop, if you cut it in the morning or if you cut it in the evening, you let it sit on the field. For the first few hours, it will continue to photosynthesize. It will produce sugars, uh, so whether it's cut in the evening or in the morning. And it will do that until it gets to about 30% dry matter, and then it will stop because the cells will be, will be killed, essentially. So if you cut in the morning and you don't, uh, you don't uh, condition the crop, it'll, it'll, it, will, it will photosynthesize for a few hours and produce sugars. The same thing if it's cut in PM. Uh, okay, so for you, Robert, why did the, sorry, why did the beef heifers only prefer PM hay for the first two hours in the disappearance study and then ate both AM and PM hay at the same rate for the next 22 hours? What was going on in the feed bunk? Um, that's a good question. Um, those were steers, by the way. They were castrated males, but uh, it wouldn't. It wouldn't change, I think, the fact that uh, uh, there seems to be a, a, um, an early short-term response um, to this uh, high sugar material. Um, it, the rate of decrease in, the, in the, those bunks, as a matter of fact, slowed down and became pretty much the same after a while. You're absolutely correct. I don't have a... Um, very good explanation for this, although I would say that you can hypothesize, like the Australians have, that the animal will try to somehow balance uh, the supply of sugars and protein um, in the rumen. So this may have to do with some sort of a feedback uh, that was given to the animal after the first two hours. Okay, uh, I think this one's for you, Gio. When cutting hay with a hay bind, should we take the pressure off the crimpers or should we be cutting with a grain swather? Well, what, we've, what we've found, and I think Robert could probably add to that, is that it's better to not use any conditioning uh, at the time of cutting, but maybe Robert, you'd like to add a few words uh, on, on that. Uh, I, I live very close to Tom Kilser and all of this business about, uh, you know, conditioning and non-conditioning um, is probably related to this. Uh, what his work has shown, and Jill summarized this quite well earlier, is that if you don't condition, um, you actually have a very good drying rate in the initial phase of drying of the forage, of wilting. And then when the stomats close at about 30 to 35 percent dry matter, then it really slows down. So it really depends on what you want to do here. If you want to make dry hay, you should definitely continue to condition and use a crimper. 
um, any types of rolls. I would prefer rolls with legumes, for example, than crimpers with uh, teeth, um, for example. But if you want to harvest forage that is above 50% dry matter, I definitely still recommend conditioning. If, on the other hand, you want to harvest material that is on the higher moisture side, if I can put it this way, then I would not recommend conditioning. Okay, uh, next question. How does rainfall impact plant sugar levels during the wilting phase? Mr. Gilles, do you want to start with that one? Well, uh, this is something that we haven't, uh, we haven't really looked at. Uh, uh, I don't say it would probably, the, the, the fact that if, it's, if it rains, it'll take, you know, the crop will stay longer uh, in the field and uh, you're most likely to lose a lot more sugar. So uh, we haven't really, we haven't quantified that. Uh, so I, I kind of give you like a quantified answer, but if it rains and the crop stays in the field longer, uh, you'll lose, you'll probably lose more sugars. And, and so that's not a good, it's not a good thing. Okay, next question for Robert. In rotational grazing beef cattle on a 50-50 grass legume, is it better to give cattle a new paddock later in the afternoon? Um, I would say yes, um, generally. Uh, I would say yes, not because of our work, because our work was done with a strip grazing, but I would refer you to some work that was done in South America in Argentina, as a matter of fact, and that was repeated in the U.S. Um, uh, by a scientist, I'm sorry, I forget his name now, but anyways, it was published in the Journal of Animal Science, and this person showed that if you uh, give animals access to a new paddock in the afternoon, uh, there is a, a benefit in terms of uh, uh, higher intake and um, higher sugar contents of this uh, grass when you grass legume mixture. Okay, next question. Uh, for Gilles, did you measure respiration losses during the night when no photosynthesis was taking place or is this going to be the same for both the cut and uncut forage? Uh, we looked. Yes, we did. We did look. We did not really measure uh, respiration, but we looked at a loss of sugars during the night, and, and that occurs if you cut PM. There'll be a loss of sugars. But what happens is that the next morning, uh, even though it was cut in the PM, the crop will start uh, photosynthesize again, and will get back its uh, its sugars. So, uh, in both cases, a cut crop and an uncut crop, there'll be losses of sugars during the night due to respiration. And I would assume from what we've seen at about the same rate. Okay, and Gio, how does sugar content affect RFV? Uh, I don't believe, and again, my colleague, the animal nutritionist, could help me, but I don't believe that sugars are included in the, uh, in the uh, relative feed value calculations. So I don't know, Robert, or would you have a... Yeah, the only, the only way it would affect, Tracy, is that if there's an uh, increase in sugar that is big enough to cause a reduction in fibers, ADF uh, or NDF, and then it would have an indirect effect on RFV. But otherwise, you will not see it. And as we showed you, um, the increase in sugars that we've seen, like up to 4 percentage units that sh Gilles has shown, oftentimes are associated with a mixture in the reduction of crude protein and fiber and or both, you know. So it's, it's, uh, it's not always the same other nutrient that is reduced. So we cannot say that it would have a constant effect on RFV, RFV being based on fibers. Okay. I think that's, that's an interesting point that uh, as Robert has mentioned, yeah, we, we often see a decrease in NDF or in fiber concentration when you increase sugar concentration. And we also see a decrease in the, in the nitrogen concentration of forage. So if you combine the increase with the sugar concentration and the decrease in nitrogen concentration, so you've got a ratio between the two that is a lot improved uh, with increasing sugar concentration. So you work on both. You increase sugars, 
and you decrease your nitrogen concentration. So you have a sort of a double effect by increasing sugar concentration. Okay. And looking at the time, it's after 9 o'clock already, which I know is after 10 p.m. where you guys are. So I'm going to ask one more question. Uh, I think this one is directed at Robert, and then we'll move on. What role does Italian ryegrass with a legume influence, influence sugar content of the silage? Well, of course, when you're talking about Italian ryegrass, uh, Lolium multiflorum in Latin, uh, you're talking about uh, probably the grass species that contains the most sugars of them all. Uh, we, we did not use it in our studies because it's not perennial here. It's, it's an annual or a biannual in some cases, depending on the type that you would actually grow. But definitely, if you have Italian ryegrass, I can, I can I'm pretty certain that you would have high sugar silage. Okay, great. So I apologize to the folks that sent in some questions that we didn't have a chance to address tonight. Um, if you've got burning questions, feel free to email those in. Or, of course, talk to your forage or extension specialist who you would likely find through your provincial ministry of agriculture. And there's just a couple more important things I wanted to let you know about before we go. Uh, to get more information and science-based production advice, there's a few different free email lists I encourage you to sign up to. Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada has an email, uh, an e-newsletter called Agri-Info, and you can visit their website there to sign up to that. If you're in the dairy sector, be sure to visit dairyresearchblog.ca. You can sign up to their email. And for those of you in the beef sector, be sure to visit our website, beefresearch.ca, and click on that subscribe button. If you've got a Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube account, you can connect with all of us there as well. Our next webinar will be on April 8th on managing manure nutrients on forages with Dr. Shabtai Bittman, who is a research scientist at the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada Research Center in British Columbia. Uh, so another excellent speaker. Shabtai is a very good and knowledgeable presenter. So. Be sure to sign up to that one. We are actually just finalizing the details, so you're not able to register for it just yet. But keep an eye out on our websites or our social media accounts. Or if you're subscribed uh, to the beefresearch.ca blog, then you'll definitely receive an email about this webinar as soon as all the details are ready. After the webinar ends, you'll be asked to complete a short five-question survey that asks about tonight's session and what you're most interested in for future topics. We do need your feedback to do the je best job that we can to deliver information that's useful and meaningful to you and helps you make informed decisions on what's best for your operation. So please do take the time to complete that short survey. And don't hesitate to contact us with questions or comments or suggestions at any time. You'll receive that email from me with the link to the recording in just a couple of days. Uh, and it'll also include a few links to additional information on Sweet Forages. And that's it. So thanks to all of you at home for your interest. And on behalf of everyone, thank you very much to Dr. Boulanger, Dr. Bertion, and Dr. Tremblay for volunteering your time and expertise with this webinar. So good night. Thank you.